We're going to talk about important drug-drug interactions in women aging with HIV. So uh, the, I'm going to talk about the context, so why, you probably can all figure it out, but why am I talking about this topic? We're going to look at some specific interactions and then we're going to look at how we can manage them. So the context is because, as you've heard many times during the meetings, during these meetings and before, um, aging with HIV seems to be associated with the development of multimorbidity that may occur more frequently and earlier in life than what happens in people who are aging without HIV. These are the data from the HIV um, cohort from the Netherlands that have been published a couple of years ago. And uh, we are uh, looking after a population of people who, uh, again, seem to be affected, may be affected, probably not all of them, but some of them may be affected by premature aging of one or more uh, organs in the human body. What we are going to focus about over the next 20, 25 minutes is the fact that because of multimorbidity and because of HIV infection itself, the likelihood for these people to be on polypharmacy is uh, very high. Um, polypharmacy is defined as if the use of five drugs in one individual uh, is common in older adults and it's very common in people living with HIV. And uh, important polypharmacy is actually defined as using 10 drugs in an individual. And I'm sure you all know in your, uh, you've seen in your practice people on important polypharmacy quite, quite frequently. One of the reasons why it is important is because both polypharmacy pharmacy, especially important polypharmacy, are associated with more negative outcome of drug-drug interactions, hospitalizations, and so on. Um, what we are also starting to see, which is, which might be common uh, in um, uh, the practice of geriatricians, of uh, who look after people without HIV, but it's also becoming uh, more common uh, in uh, people living with HIV, is that the, popu the aging population that we're looking after, who is on polypharmacy, is not only at a higher risk of drug-drug interactions between antiretroviral drugs and other drugs used to treat comorbidities and so on, but we have uh, shown from the POPI study, which is a, a quite large cohort study happening in the United Kingdom and Ireland, that these people are also at a higher risk of drug-drug interactions between non-antiretrovirals and non-antiretrovirals, uh, meaning, again, that they are sometimes on so many drugs and they might come to your clinic and present with a certain toxicity pattern with the side effects. And you might think, but this person is not on a boosted return of, uh, sorry, on a boosted protease inhibitors, but maybe the drug interaction is actually uh, beyond the use of the, the three antiretrovirals that you prescribed. Uh, finally, it is quite important to remember that the uh, pharmacokinetics of drugs may be also affected by agents, and this uh, means uh, that the outcome of drug-drug interactions may be different and sometimes worse in people who are aging. And this is very important, again, in a population of people who are uh, more likely to be on polypharmacy. So age may affect uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and uh, renal elimination of drugs. So some drugs, like lip lipophilic drugs, like protease inhibitors, for example, may show higher concentrations in people living with HIV who are aging. And this is because of um, the fact that aging is associated to having less muscular mass and more uh, fat mass, for example. And again, there are lipophilic drugs that tend to accumulate in uh, fat cells, and therefore the clearance of the drugs would be uh, slowed down, and, and for many other reasons. So, um, I like to spend the time uh, looking at charts. Uh, what are the most commonly drugs um, that uh, doctors prescribe? And I tried to average uh, Europe with the United States. Um, so, in general, 
the most frequently prescribed drugs in aging people are listed here. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, statins, antihypertensive, uh, especially ramipril and amlodipine, levothyroxine, omeprazole, antibiotics, especially azithromycin and amoxicillin, metformin. And I think in your minds, you're thinking, oh, look, a lot of them do interact with some of the antiretrovirals. And this is when it's starting to be uh, important that we have a little bit of background knowledge about pharmacology and drug-drug interactions between, uh, again, drugs that people may be prescribed outside HIV and uh, antiretrovirals. Uh, with the focus on, on women, the most uh, uh, prescribed drugs, these are um, drugs in the chart of the 200 most prescribed drugs to people who are aging. There is a hormone replacement therapy uh, at uh, and uh, post uh, menopause, uh, oral contraceptives, which are still uh, important for um, aging women because uh, uh, perimenopausal women may still take oral contraception. Supplements, iron, calcium are becoming quite important in people living with HIV because of the drug-drug interactions that have been uh, shown to uh, happen with the uh, integrase inhibitors, herbal remedies, antidepressants, anticoagulants, antiplatelets are becoming really important as this new class of drugs uh, that uh, uh, is being used very, very frequently and may uh, interact with some antiretrovirals, chemotherapy, tamoxifen and biphosphonates. So just uh, uh, let's look at this lady. This is a 74 years old Caucasian woman who are affected by multimorbidity, living with HIV. She has diabetes, hypertension, and uh, she comes to your clinic saying that she has been diagnosed with breast cancer. So as you can see, she's easily on polypharmacy. She's on a quite old, if you allow me, antiretroviral treatment. She's on Maraviroc, Darunavir, Ritonavir. Um, she was actually enrolled in a clinical trial and then uh, got out of the clinical trial because of toxicity. Her antiretroviral treatment was changed and she's, she remained on, on this for a while. She's on a glycoside, atorvastatin and a uh, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker and the doctor uh, told her she's going to be given uh, FAC for uh, chemotherapy and tamoxifen and we'll look at details in a second. So just in terms of glycoside because I uh, I think that it is quite important that if you see someone like this lady who comes to your clinic from someone else, um, I think it's quite important to review everything she's on. Uh, and uh, glycoside, for example, is uh, uh, could be decreased by the use of darunavir ritonavir because it is metabolized by cytochrome P four fifty two C nine that is induced by ritonavir. So this is a little bit more complex than the typical drug drug interactions that we would expect between a co medication and the boosted protease inhibitors. But this is why we use tools like the Liverpool uh, University website or the Canadian drug drug interactions website side to help us in guidance on managing uh, people on polypharmacy. So I think that here uh it's when we uh, wonder whether this lady uh, should actually change her antiretrovirals. So shall we optimize the anti-diabetes treatment? Uh, shall we call the general practitioner or the metabolic doctor and say, can you please change glycoside? This might not be the optimal drug to control diabetes in this lady. Or if possible, uh, shall we change uh, the antiretroviral treatment and give her a, uh, an antiretroviral regimen associated to a low potential for drug-drug interaction. So the good news, uh, sorry, and similarly, uh, she's on um uh, in terms of, uh, of the breast cancer, she's going to receive doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, and fluoro fluorouracil. And you can see that uh, especially um, cyclophosphamide is characterized by a high potential for interacted with boosted protease inhibitors, as well as tamoxifen, which she will receive after completing uh, the chemotherapy. So um, this is again a chart from the Liverpool website. That 
that can help you and guide you uh, in uh, advising the oncology on whether uh, the, um, the uh, whether this patient is more likely to develop toxicities because of drug drug interactions and uh, uh, it is important to work together to make sure that uh, the efficacy of the treatment is is the best so fortunately, this lady is actually infected by a wild type virus. So her antiretroviral therapy can today easily be modified uh, by, um, and, and uh, she could be prescribed either an unboosted integrase inhibitor with two NRTIs or even uh, an innovative strategies like 3TCDTG if uh, it's uh, safe and she doesn't have hepatitis B and so on, just as an idea. But anyway, a, a combination that is characterized by a low potential for drug-drug interactions. But this other lady is unfortunately a little bit less lucky. So this is another lady who is uh, a 51 years old Ugandan woman. Uh, she's currently on TAF FTC Darunavir cobicistat, and her viral load is not undetectable. Uh, she has a history of poor adherence and uh, a resistant test that shows extensive resistance to NRTI and an NRTIs. So in her uh, in her case, it would be probably a little bit more difficult to just very quickly modify antiretroviral therapy and give her something that is still efficacious and safe for her to take to maintain, uh, to, to, to achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. So she came to our uh, over 50 clinic at Chelsea Westminster Hospital and uh, she reported hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, mood change, fatigue, weight gain and so on. So we referred her to the HIV menopause clinic that we also run uh, at Chelsea Westminster Hospital. And uh, they, uh, with then, and this is when we started to work together because they advise her to take HRT, and uh, they advise a first or second line treatment, which is estradiol uh, patches or uh, estradiol gel if she doesn't tolerate the patch, plus oral natural progesterone, or she can also have the patches with the, the estrogens and the progesterone together. However, there is an interaction between HRT and uh, some antiretrovirals. In this case, uh, we are looking at boosted protease inhibitors. So she's on Darunavir cobicistat. And cobicistat is a strong inhibitor of cytokine P453A4. Uh, therefore, um, the levels of both estradiol and progesterone can be increased. So you need, as the doctor providing care and trying to optimize her exposure to HRT, her exposure to um, estrogens, you probably need to work with this lady and find the lowest effective dose. So the dose that works on her symptoms, so your pharmacodynamic parameters is how she feels, and uh, avoid... Um, select this dose to avoid potential estrogens adverse events like DVT, uh, pulmonary embolic stroke, and myocardial infections that may be common, uh, slightly more common in postmenopausal women on estrogens. Uh, although she is again taking the patches and the gel, which are already associated to a lower rate of toxicity because then the oral um, remedies, it is again very important to make sure we select the dose. And just to further complicate the picture, if she was on ritonavir, it would be exactly the other way around because ritonavir decreases the exposure of estrogen. So you have to work on the other way, make sure you increase the estrogens until she feels better and probably stop there to avoid overdose and, uh, and toxicity. Uh, all of this to say that uh, you don't probably you don't need to um, remember the details going up, going down to C9. In and, and, and all of the story, I say I actually mean sometimes to say it like this, but just to 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 share my point where we just need to sit down, think, work with the tools we have, maybe with colleagues that are expert in the field and with the specialists that can deliver the other half of the care to a patient who has multimorbidity, polypharmacy, and so on. And this is the, uh, the, the how to deliver individualized cares in the context of, of polypharmacy. Now, it is very important, I believe, to also touch on the transgender women. So, uh, 
because drug interactions concern um, uh, has been shown to um, concern uh, negatively uh, people uh, who are transgender, transgender women, um, and um, uh, who live with HIV. So again, this is a case of a lady uh, who uh, is 52 years old, identifies herself as a transgender woman. She's from Argentina. She had been diagnosed with HIV 15 years ago. Uh, there are uh, her um, medical records that back to 2010 in the UK. There is a, you, you see her in clinic, you receive a transfer of care letter uh, saying that she uh, has a history of poor adherence and a history of virological failure, but you don't have a resistant test and she's on Truvada, Darunaviritonavir. She has an undetectable viral load, a good CD4 count, she's asymptomatic. That's what the letter says, and she doesn't have any other co-infections. So very uh, important question. How are you? Let's have a good conversation here. Let's spend some time, okay? This is a person in front of you, highly likely to be on polypharmacy. Um, she's losing weight and she's not feeling very well. And if I think that if you are able to actually open up and have the right conversation, uh, you, you can get some very important information from this person. She says she um, would like to feel better. She says that she's been seeing a lot of doctors that just keep giving her these drugs for HIV. She understands she has to take them, but she doesn't feel very well. Uh, she thinks uh, that they, uh, these drugs we prescribe interfere with her hormones, and her hormones are really important for her. And uh, um, she feels that no one understands what she's trying to explain to us which is probably true and that's again re deserves requires more time to be spent with this person so the Liverpool website has a very uh, useful I would say uh, chart that actually lists the most uh, likely used uh, feminizing hormones and the potential for drug drug interactions and again we are in a situation where this uh, uh, patient has to be on a boosted agent which is not ideal especially today when we have uh, potent safe um, third agents that are unboosted and are associated to a lower potential for drug-drug interactions. But what it is important again in this uh, subject is that we don't have studies about feminizing hormones and uh, uh, antiretrovirals. We have a very few starting to emerge uh, with uh, with tenofovir from uh, from IAS last year, uh, but we don't have the ideal graph. This is uh, what uh, I, I love spending my life doing: giving drugs to people, taking their blood, and drawing the pretty colorful graphs. If the graph shows like this side, there is no interaction, and then everything is green. If the drug shows like that side, it's very easy. It's red. Don't give it to the patients. Unfortunately, as I was trying to say before, it's much more complicated. In this and we don't have this for everybody or for all the drugs we have for each drug the therapeutic window and a person in front of you and uh, we're gonna have to listen to this person and uh, the exposure of the hormones she takes is within their therapeutic window when she says oh this is how I should feel I'm happy now okay that, that is all you have no pretty graphs um, if the exposure of the hormones is too high or too low, she's going to not be happy. So that's, that's quite important. Uh, and that is uh, a, a fundamental part of clinical pharmacology. So what should we do? Listen, definitely. Learn, definitely. Use the tools available. Um, this is a, a, a newsletter that the Liverpool website sent last week, which is uh, uh, going to uh, save a little bit of our time. The Canadian uh, Drug Interactions website was already doing it. Uh, I was kind of doing it myself, but it was a little bit more uh, time confusing. So what is really good is that if you have a patient on Ritonavir and he needs an antiarrhythmic such as amiodarone and the uh, um, co-administration of these drugs is contraindicated because of a significant important drug drug interactions that leads to an increase in amiodarone and therefore toxicity they are now going to give you alternatives so they're going to give you a list of drugs that you may be using and again I was doing this a lot with the anticoagulants 
because there are some that can be used with cobicist and some that can be used with ritonavir. They give you a little bit of advice in how to modify the dose. So it's going to make the role of the clinician easier. But again, they don't want to make the decision for you. You still, as a HIV care provider, need to advise the other uh, the colleague that is uh, delivering the care of the other comorbidities work together and try to find uh, the optimal treatment. So this is uh, the example for the anticoagulants. So if you again want to give ritonavir and you have someone, uh, you have a letter from the uh, from the hematologist or the cardiologist saying, uh, can can I start a piximab in this patient? The patient is on ritonavir, and you say no. Uh, you get a letter the day after saying, thank you very much. What shall I give? So if you do it straight away, you click on the blue one now, and you have a all the, coagul the anticoagulants uh, and uh, which ones could be given or not. So for example, uh, edoxaban, it uh, could be uh, safer than a pixiban. It's not red, it's just amber. And you can start with a lower dose of 30 milligrams rather than 60 in people who are on a boosted protease inhibitors to whom you can't modify antiretroviral treatment because they still need to be on the uh, protease inhibitor. So, apologies if uh, sometimes this feels like climbing Mount Everest. Uh, I think that, uh, again, it is uh, um, drug drug interactions are an important concern in, in women aging with HIV, but they're manageable. They're manageable by changing drugs, they're manageable by uh, adjusting doses, and they're manageable by maybe few extra visits and finding the right dose uh, for um, the uh, co-medications and again, and the right antiretrovirals when it's possible. So in conclusion, uh, the risk for drug interactions, again, it's inevitable uh, in uh, aging women uh, with HIV, but the knowledge uh, that we have and the tools are fundamental, they're available, and they can help us to manage this. those adjustments and alternatives that make the management of these drug, drug interactions possible. And uh, um, I think uh, multi-specialty uh, MDTs are very, very helpful. We do spend in London at Chelsea Westminster Hospital quite a lot of time on this kind of patients who go through the resistant tests, all of their communications, how they feel. Uh, and uh, we have specialist clinics now that are attached to the over 50 clinic. So we have a metabolic HIV clinic, a cardiology HIV clinic, menopausal HIV clinic, over 50 clinic, geriatric HIV clinic, where we actually work together so that the patient can come to one appointment. It might last for an hour, an hour and a half. I understand that the resources uh, conversation is very important also associated to this uh, but uh, it really really helpful to manage this uh, this kind of people on uh, on polypharmacy thank you very much for your attention so Martin, thank you I think that as you say these are problems that we all face on day-to-day level and, and it's really important to have those links with all the important specialists. So, any questions, Marta? Yes, at the front. Uh, thank you uh, for the talk. I, I want to ask you about the um, a complementary alternative medication that the that, that patients uh, consume a lot and they don't tell you that. They don't consider it as medication. Do you have uh, something to say about it? Thank you. So yes, I, I have a lot to say, actually. <laughs> I did. <laughs> thank you for the question. And I did mention it briefly. You are absolutely right. I just went through remedies and herbal remedies very, very quickly. It's really, really important. And I think, uh, to, to, as you say, people take a lot. And I think that sometimes, because people uh, aging might not feel very well, they're actually taking it even more. So a, a, a list of examples. I don't know examples. I don't know if you agree with me. Uh, turmeric, jingo, biloba, uh, um, ginseng, uh, echinacea, garlic, and so on. Right. So. Um, 
these uh, remedies, some of these remedies do actually have effect on the metabolic pathways of the drug that uh, we prescribe either for HIV or for medications and therefore drug-drug interactions may occur. The, we know uh, much less obviously on remedies than, than on drugs. Um, I remember looking after an incredibly complex aging woman on 20 medications and uh, she was uh, on uh, some very complex anti-pain therapy that was metabolized by cytokine P452C9 and turmeric is an inducer of cytokine P452C9 and we didn't know uh, how to uh, she was adamant she had to take it and that's the other thing I mean she was on 20 drugs so probably we should have tried to modify and, and simplify her whole drug regimen but she wanted to take the herbal so in the ideal world, uh, they should be avoided because of the lack of knowledge we have. Uh, so they don't tell you about it, but pharmacists are really good at getting it out of people. I learned it all from pharmacists where they, qu they spend time with the patient and say, what do you take? What do you take every morning? What do you eat? What do you introduce in your mouth? So th that, that is a way, again, time. It's time consuming, but that is a way where you actually can get everything out. And the advice today is still to avoid them because of the lack of interactions. Please keep in mind, sometimes also it's important to understand that not all interactions outcome are as, as important as those when you give ritonavir with amiodarone. But because we don't know, because there's no studies, we tend to say to avoid them.